35A. All that we're going to do, which is basically, we talked about uh, EMP, Emden Meyerhoff pathway. We don't really need to talk about citric acid. All it is is, and really, we don't even need to talk about the two cycles today, technically, in that, you know, really, once you've shown one metabolic cycle, they're all kind of the same, but it's good to get more than one example so that you can kind of think about things. Um, is this finally working? I think so. Just being terribly slow. Remind me not to write on the bottom of the screen because obviously that apparently is not uh, being recorded. So I'll try to stick to the middle. And this is all, oh, I give you a couple handouts with all these chemical reactions on them. They're the ones that we'll talk about during the lecture. So if you want to pull those out, probably happy. But what we're going to look at is in chapter 35A, we're going to look at fatty acid metabolism. Are you kidding me? No, restart later. So does everyone remember what a fatty acid looks like? Yeah, they're just giant carboxylic acids. And so we've looked at the metabolism of glucose. And really, you don't have to know the structure of glucose or really necessarily even the structure of a fatty acid to do most of the questions on the test because you're going to be given most of the chemical reactions in order to just talk about what's happening in the steps. And so you know, we don't have to really worry about that part as much as we would some of the other steps. So what we really want to look at is just kind of the basics of what the structures are. So fatty acids, we remember, contain more energy than carbohydrates. And why do they contain more energy? Because they're more reduced and because they're a higher percentage or a higher mass of carbon, meaning there's more carbon-hydrogen bonds. For instance, if we take a look and compare glucose versus steric acid. And to make the comparison fair, steric acid has 18 carbons. So we really need to compare three glucose molecules, right? Because glucose each has six carbons. Oh, so we'd either have to divide whatever numbers we get out of steric acid by eight, by six, or bleh, by three, or we can realize that if we take three glucoses that we can kind of compare the same amount. So. For three glucoses, we get 36 ATP, whereas if we look at steric acid, what we'll find is we're going to get 147 ATP. And so this turns out to be about six exactly ATP per carbon, whereas if you do the math here, this is 8.2 ATP per carbon. And so you can see because it has a higher percentage of carbon, it's going to give you a higher amount of energy, and just the cycle itself gives you a higher amount of energy because fatty acids are more reduced. Uh, also, if we look at it, for instance, in your body, we, on the typical person, we have about 0.22 kilograms of carbs stored. But your average person has about 15 kilograms of fat. And so uh, this is also the preferred storage method for fat. I should have found the picture I had, I had a while back. They showed a person holding up like one pound of fat and one pound of uh, muscle. And muscle's not exactly glycogen, but it, you know it's close enough. And it's really just the other amazing part about it is the difference in the amount of space or that that appears to take up when you're doing it. Hmm? Because it contains more ATP per carbon, and so it contains or it takes up less space for the same amount of energy storage. Actually, no, I shouldn't say it that way. It doesn't take up less space per the same amount of energy storage. It takes up less effort to store that amount of energy. And so it's the preferred form of energy because it's more reduced. 
So the original theory for fatty acid metabolism, if we go way back in history, starts in 1904 with Francis Noop. And really, I don't know if this would ever show up on a test. I find this just to be kind of interesting. So if you think about it, 1904 is well before we know anything about DNA. It's well before most of the work that Fisher did on carbohydrates and things like that. So Noop is kind of a man ahead of his time. And what he proposed is that fatty acids are chopped up or, you know, we could say reacted every two carbons. Or that we basically metabolize it in two carbon chunks. And the reason he came to this conclusion, and this is why I really like it, is he did an experiment. He basically fed, oops, oh, I don't know what the name of the carbon is. Let's just draw the picture. So he fed this molecule to dogs. where he could vary the N in that molecule if he wanted to, meaning he basically took and, and put a benzene ring on a, long, on a fatty acid chain. And of course, he fed it to dogs. And then he collected the urine. And I don't know, maybe I just get a kick out of the experiment because, I mean, as far as experiments go, it's really low tech. I mean, you're, you're collecting dog urine for a living here at this point. And, but the idea behind the experiment is actually quite brilliant. What he basically said is that if you have an even number of carbons, even number of carbons metabolized at a time, then the dogs should pee benzene. And you can test for that. And that if you have an odd number, oops, odd number of carbons metabolized, then you should pee this molecule. And I might have it reversed. I'm not going to put this on a test, and I really am not uh, worried about it. I like to kind of just throw this in because it shows that chemistry can be kind of uh, entertaining, if nothing else. And so what happened is, is basically when he checked his dog pee, he saw that they peed benzene rings, or that they had benzene in their urine or when they excreted it. And I think that's kind of just kind of cute, kind of interesting things like that. Uh, not sure how useful it is. But the other thing I want to point out is that this was in 1904. And so, for instance, we're going to talk about a process called beta oxidation. And sometimes it's also referred to as the two carbon chop. So these are both names for the process by which fats are metabolized, while fatty acids are metabolized. And the name two carbon chop comes from Noop's original research to a certain extent, in that he said every two carbons were chopped off. The reason they call it beta oxidation is that if we draw a picture of a fatty acid, um, actually like this, so there's our carboxylic acid carbon. This would be the alpha carbon. This would be the beta carbon. When we break apart the molecule, we're going to see that we chop off the carboxylic end between the alpha and beta carbon. And so it's called beta oxidation because what we really do is we end up oxidizing the beta carbon. And then once you oxidize that beta carbon, 
you can of course do this process over and over again. And so what we end up doing is we end up taking a long chain fatty acid and chopping it apart many, many times. For example, if we take steric acid, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I hope that's right. It's a little hard to count those out sometimes. So this is 18 carbons long, it's steric acid. And we start breaking it apart into two carbon chunks, then we can chop it apart. And here, maybe I should use a different ink color to make it really obvious. We can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can do eight cycles of beta oxidation. And we're going to realize that that leads to nine coacetyl A's. Co, I guess I haven't written it out yet, acetyl A. And you guys should be familiar with coacetyl A, not because we talked about it in this class, but do you remember it from Todd's class? Why is coacetyl A important? This is where, because we chopped off talking about the citric acid cycle here, I'm just going to make these. Thank you. Uh, coacetyl A is what gets fed into the citric acid cycle. And so what happens is, is we do beta oxidation to chop up the uh, fatty acid into a bunch of two carbon chunks, and then we feed that coacetyl A into the citric acid cycle. So as a randomly brief review, What's responsible for the beginning of uh, fatty acid metabolism? Or I really shouldn't say metabolism, but, but for, ugh, fatty acid digestion. That would be a Jessalyn question. Saliva actually starts the breakdown of glucose and carbohydrates. Stomach acid is primarily going to break down the uh, proteins. And so we really see that um, fatty acids tend to be in the small intestines where they're hydrolyzed into the various fats. And then we add the bile salts and things like that. So let's take a look at beta oxidation. Uh, this is where your handouts will be handy so that you don't have to write the chemical reactions down. Oops, that is not what I want. So the handout you have has all five steps on one handout. And I've got it kind of broken down to where I've got a few steps. And for some reason, the steps are out of order. There we go. So the nice thing about this is the pictures in your book are actually really good. Meaning, you know, sometimes your book has not so good pictures, like we didn't use the uh, glycolysis or the Enby-Meyer half pathway in your book because we couldn't see what's happening to the molecules. Here your book shows very carefully what's happening to the molecules. And so what we want you guys to be able to recognize is sort of what's happening to, in each of these steps. So this, for instance, could be five test questions that you know, we're going to go through. And so on the test, I'm either going to pick a random step from any one of the reactions we talk about, or like I said, I can even pick other metabolic cycles because the process of examining them and looking at them is what we're trying to teach you. So who can tell me what's going on in step one? For instance, if we follow the energy, what's happening to the energy? Yeah, so because ATP is going to A and P, we actually lose energy. In fact, we lose two high energy phosphate bonds. And this is something that we should notice is kind of happens in most cycles. You always have to use energy to start the cycle off. You kind of need to jump start the process. Kind of like in a chemical reaction, we have activation energy. Same thing here with these metabolic pathways. We always have to invest energy into it to start the reaction. What else occurred in this reaction? So that's what happens to the ATP. What about what happens to the molecule? It's not so much that it loses an OH. 
I mean, it does, but it loses an OH, and then the coash, notice, loses an H, right? And so what type of reaction does that make it? Dehydration, because we lost H2O. And so really, this reaction needs to have plus H2O in it. And I don't know, I should see, maybe they fixed that in your book. I kind of doubt it. I don't know why they don't show that in your book. That's one of those little typos in your book, you can argue, on the reactant side, or on the products, product side. So we've got a dehydration reaction. And what we're really forming is what's called a thioester. So do you guys remember what the word thio means? We first encountered it, what? Yeah, SH. So notice that here I've got an S here. And so we call that a thioester. Remember, a normal ester looks like this. And so a thioester is the exact same thing, except we put a S into the molecule. Same thing if you go back and look at your alcohol chapter way back in, gosh, I think it was like chapter 22. You'll notice the very last section in that chapter talks about thiols, which are basically the sulfur equivalent of uh, alcohols. Why would sulfur, SH, and OH react the same or similar? I shouldn't say same because nothing's ever identical. What do we know about sulfur and oxygen from our periodic table? They're in the same column, right? And so we would expect sulfur and oxygen to have many of the same types of reactions. And so normally, anytime you have something that could be with an oxygen there, we can have a sulfur analog to it. Now, your body doesn't, you know, we don't do it every single time. And there are certain differences. For instance, sulfur-sulfur bonds are quite common, whereas oxygen-oxygen bonds are not. So I mean, there's obviously differences, but there's some similarities too. So we make a thioester of a fatty acid. So this coash molecule is actually a very big, complicated molecule. It's got lots of parts to it. Uh, we're not going to worry about its structure because we'll always just write coash. But I also do like to point out, this is what I call kind of a handle. Sometimes I'll call it a flag. Sometimes it's a marker. What it really is is it's some place for the uh, enzymes to interact with. Enzymes can recognize that. that coash. And so by attaching coash to this fatty acid molecule, we're signaling the body or we're signaling the next enzyme in the process to latch onto that coash and sort of do the next step in the chemical reaction. OK, what type of reaction is step two here then? I kind of started writing too far down. So I'm going to switch colors so it's, we can tell the difference between them. What's happening in this reaction? Well, let's first look at the energy. What happens to the energy? So if I look at FAD going to FADH2. Yeah, so we gain energy here for the cell, meaning our body gains some energy in the form of FADH2. How many ATP is that worth? Two. So we're already ahead now in this cycle, right? We started the cycle by attaching coash A, costing us an ATP. But already in the very next step, we've got an ATP. So one of the things about beta oxidation is that you know, we get the energy out rather quickly from the cycle, whereas with glucose, it has to go a series of reactions before we actually do it. And we have to invest even more energy into that process, right? So we're getting energy out. So that should tell you something about what happens to the molecule. And so if we take a look at it, what's happening here? What changes in it? Yeah, we form a carbon-carbon double bond. And here's where your book doesn't illustrate it as nicely as I'd like. What else happens? It's not really shown so well. You have to kind of think about it. And you have to think about what type of reactions in the past form carbon-carbon double bonds. Hmm? Addition is adding the hydrogen to the carbon-carbon double bond. And so to make the carbon-carbon double bond, we can also remove hydrogen. So notice that here we lose 
a hydrogen from each carbon. And so notice that we lose bonds to hydrogen. What does that indicate for a type of reaction? You know, it better be an oxidation. Because remember, the FAD right here is a reduction because it gained bonds to hydrogen. Gains bonds to hydrogen. And so one of the names that we could say is this is an oxidation. If we really think about it from the past and we go back, and this is only a chemist would call it this, so we really should stick with that oxidation, but elimination reaction, meaning we eliminated hydrogen from the molecule, right? So as a chemist, we would have just called it an elimination, but it's also an oxidation reaction. And you might even hear it as a dehydrogenation reaction because we're losing hydrogen from the molecule too. But probably the most appropriate name is to call it an oxidation because that tells us what's happening. So we've got an oxidation reduction happening here, right? One thing is reduced, something else is oxidized. So step two, we're already getting energy out. What's happening in, oh, I forgot, the slides got out of order somehow. I was trying to put them back in, oh, here's that Francis Noop one. I should have just looked for that. No, I don't want to restart. I should just call Microsoft up and ask them if they'd like a restart. Uh, anyway, step three, what's happening here? Yeah, we're breaking the double bond. And when we break a double bond, we call that what type of reaction? When we add something to both sides of the double bond, we call it an addition reaction. So if nothing else, this is also good practice for the final in that a lot of the chemistry we're seeing in these biochemical pathways are going to show up in the final as reactions that you have to recall. So what do we add across that double bond then? Hmm? So remember, we always think about water like this. Notice that here I'm adding an OH to one side of that double bond. And so, see, the way your book does it, see that's H and that's H2. It doesn't make it really obvious what's happening, does it? If I was a chemist doing this, I would make sure that I showed that H as being kind of hanging off the atom so that you could see when that second H is added. So basically what we did is we added water across that molecule or across that carbon-carbon double bond. What about energy? So notice there's no ATP, F, oops, FAD, NAD, or anything like that. Therefore, there's no energy change. At least no usable energy change. Certainly, for a chemical reaction to occur, there's always a change in energy. We should probably say and be careful you know, when we phrase things like that. There's no usable energy change. The body doesn't gain any energy in this reaction. The body isn't required to supply any energy in this chemical reaction. It's basically an energy neutral step. Um, put one more point on that oxidation. We should remember that if I take, I'm sorry, not an oxidation. If I take a carbon-carbon double bond plus H2O, I get a alcohol. Oh, I have no idea why I have that in my notes. It's already said. What about step four? And again, I'll switch colors so it's easy because I tend to kind of should probably just put one of these per slide. What's happening in step four? To me, the first place I always look should be energy because that's the easiest to follow, right? So what's happening to the energy in this reaction? Meaning NAD is going to NADH. Yeah, so the cell gains energy, and that means that we're reducing that coenzyme. So one of the reasons we wanted to learn about the coenzymes and bioenergetics in Chapter 33 is so that when we see them in chemical reactions in Chapter 34 and Chapter 35, we're used to what's happening with them. Now, that should almost already clue you in with what must be happening in the other part of the molecule. What has to be happening to this part of the molecule? 
Oops, started going too far. So if something's reduced, something usually has to be oxidized. So notice that we go from a alcohol and we make a ketone. And I guess if we're being really specific, that's a secondary alcohol. So again, good review. We know that a secondary alcohol gets oxidized to a ketone, right? Meaning, yes? It would depend on the circumstances. I mean, if you're talking about an actual biochemical pathway, it probably is one or the other. If you're talking about like a, a chemical reaction in a beaker where you've got a bunch of OHs on a molecule that get oxidized, then likely all of them are. Like for instance, um, totally aside, we got room. I th oops. Yeah, we got room on this slide. You guys might remember this reaction where we did uh, you know, something like this. Oh, wait. Never mind. We didn't do that reaction. But yeah, if you're looking at a molecule like this and you're oxidizing it, usually you're going to end up oxidizing both of those. Now, in some cases, depending upon the specific chemical reaction, you can only oxidize one part of a molecule. Like remember when we talked about glucoses? We were able to selectively oxidize certain parts of it by using mild or strong oxidation. Oops, where are we? Yeah, I know. I'm just wondering on the slides. Oh, we had started writing on it. That's, I'm like, that one we already did. So we're still on step four, I think. I don't know if there's anything else to say on it. So we know that the cell gains energy. The molecule has to lose energy. The molecule itself is oxidized. The cell is reduced. What would be another name for this sort of reaction? Meaning, what did we lose in this molecule? Yeah, we lost an H and an H. So that carbon-carbon double bond is forming from those two H's. So we lost two hydrogens. So that means it's a dehydrogenation. But again, we'd probably call it an oxidation reaction simply because that implies more about the energy. And then notice that that's the hydrogen that goes to that NADH, and that's that hydrogen that forms the H+. So what I really want you guys to be able to do for all the reactions that can possibly be on the test and all the ones that we're going to look at here is you know, first look and see if anything happens energetically. Then I really want you to look at what happens in the chemical reaction. Find the part of the molecule that changes and be able to recognize whether I'm you know, oxidizing something, reducing something, whether I'm adding water to something, removing water, all those kind of reactions that we've talked about in the past in the organic chemistry. And hopefully, with the two cycles we'll do today, all of those will be refreshed in your brain. Because we, I think, hit like 90% of them in this. So that's step four. Notice that, again, we've gained energy, right? So this beta oxidation is pretty quickly, you know, supplying a surplus of energy. I guess just for uh, review, how, much, how many ATP would that end up being converted to? Three, just to keep everyone honest. Here's step five. What's happening in step five? So this is kind of a new step, something that we haven't seen necessarily before. But what we're doing is we're breaking the molecule apart. Here's where that two carbon chop happens. And sometimes this reaction is called the cleavage step because you're cleaving the molecule in two, like with a meat cleaver or something. And so what we're doing is we're losing this two carbon chunk. And notice that we've also got another coash A. And so that is reacting with the uh, carbonyl group to restart the process. Oops. So 
So for instance, if this molecule had started out as 18 carbons, and now notice that it just has R there, so that number could be anything, right? What we end up with now is this mo a molecule that has 16 carbons plus that two carbon fragment. And so now what happens is this molecule right here goes back to step two. And so we can keep chopping off this carbon by simply repeating the cycle over and over and over again. Probably some books, and look, some books will draw this kind of a picture like this, where they'll have it go like this. And you know, here you've got 18 carbons at the start, and then it goes through a series of reactions, and here's step two. You've got, you know, now you're back down to 16 carbons. And so that cycle can keep going out, and then coming out of that is all of those coacetyl A's, and those can be fed into the citric acid cycle. And of course, there's also lots of other outputs like that. I kind of like some of Todd's uh, pictures in the books where they show all the outputs. And of course, in here, we'd have to make an ATP to AMP, things like that, right? Meaning you can draw these reactions in a large number of different ways. Like the reason they call it the citric acid cycle is it cycles, right? I don't know why they don't call it the beta oxidation cycle, because that's what's happening, right? So you could call it that, but for whatever reason, they call it the two carbon chop beta oxidation. Yes, it's wanting to restart, of course. It's going to keep reminding me. It's worse than my ex-wife, except I don't have an ex-wife, so. I had one class convinced one year that I had two ex-wives or three ex-wives. It was kind of funny at the beginning of the semester. I thought it was humorous. I don't know. Um, so what we really see is that uh, this is what Noop said 100 years ago, and it took him 50 years to actually start to prove this. So let's see. We don't want to talk about that yet. We want to go back to some blank slides. Oops. Well, in this case, certainly we're losing energy, right? And we're going from 18 carbons down to 16 carbons. So that should be a catabolic process, right? Or have I got them mixed up again in my head? Anabolic is building up, catabolic is breaking down. Or do I have it reversed? I was going to say, some days my brain ain't too wired right. So, for example, if we take a 16 carbon molecule, like say palmitic acid, it has 16 carbons. And we, you know, perform or it undergoes beta oxidation. How much energy do we get out? So if I've got 16 carbons, how many chops can I do? I can do eight chops. And so that really means that I go through the cycle eight times, right? So I am minus one ATP to start, right? Meaning that very first step, attaching that coash A to it, costs me an ATP, right? How much do I get out of it? So go back and look on your summary of steps and go ahead and count them up. How many FADs are made? So I make one FAD H2 per cycle, right? So that means I make a total of eight FAD H2s. I make one NAD per cycle. NADH, I guess I should put. And so that means I make eight NADHs per cycle. And notice that technically, I'm going to put this off to the side, technically, no ATP is produced in beta oxidation. Because really, we need to feed those into our mitochondria. And so therefore, we need some O2, and we need to do some oxidative 
phosphorylation, phosphorylation, whatever, I don't care about the spelling. And how many ATP do I get out of doing that after that? So each FAD is worth times 2 equals 16 ATP, right? And then I've got 8 NADH2s, and they each make 3, so that's 24 ATP. And so I really am making, what, 40 ATP? But also recall that I have to subtract 1 to start. And notice I make 39 ATP. So we can do biochemical math and figure out how many ATP we make in a cycle. Now, we should also point out that we also make, and I apologize, I'm kind of going in a big circle here. I really should just go to a new slide and start over, but for some reason I just haven't wanted to switch slides. To me, this is all on one topic. We also make eight coacetyl A's. And so those get to go into the citric acid cycle and make more ATP. So we're really not even done here. It's kind of the same thing with when we looked at uh, glycolysis or that emden meyerhoff pathway. At the end of that pathway, we would need to feed that material into an intermediate step, that pyruvate, and that pyruvate gets a coacetyl A in, added onto it, and then we can send that off into the citric acid cycle also. So there's more energy left after both of the processes we're talking about, but we've kind of gotten both of those processes, or you know, we've gotten the start of that energy out. And so the citric acid cycle is kind of the central cycle that everything feeds into so that we don't duplicate a bunch of chemical reactions and steps. Taylor, did you have a question? Okay, we're just playing with your hair? Okay. So that's two examples of catabolic processes that we looked at. We're going to look at one example of a catabolic or an anabolic process, I mean. Whoops. And technically, normally we would cover photosynthesis. So normally we get a second one, but we skipped photosynthesis this year due to time constraints, and we'll just focus on these. I'd say about 50-50% of the time I managed to cover, say, transamination react or um, the proteins, and about 50% of the time I didn't. So this year we didn't. I used to get all worked up and bent out of shape and try to cram it in. Now I've decided it's not worth it, that you get the same amount of ideas talking about all these reactions. And proteins, well, they're not nearly as exciting. They don't even get their own chapter, which I feel sorry for them. So if we kind of look at this, overall what we're saying is that we just looked at how fatty acids through beta oxidation can make acetyl coenzyme A. And the reverse process is what, what we're going to look at now. This is called lipogenesis. Genesis. And so to me, I like that word genesis. It simply means we're making things that are lipids. So lipogenesis kind of makes sense. And so one of the things before we get started, and maybe I should, well, maybe I'll do this at the end. We'll summarize it at the end. It kind of makes sense. So again, there's a series of reactions for this. If you look in your book, the series of reactions skips the first step. And so uh, they call it a preliminary, oops, going the wrong direction, scroll up. So your book calls this not a step, but I think it should be a step. So we're going to call it step zero. So this is a preparation step. So here's our acetyl coenzyme A. So this would be gotten from probably beta oxidation. And so what's happening in this reaction? You guys are getting good at it now. Are you going to get mad if I call on people, or should I just let people shout out answers? Yeah, we lose energy, so we lose 
and ATP. So again, we have to input energy. And I, I guess, actually, I should rephrase that. One of the things we'll notice is that this is an anabolic process, right? We're going to input a lot of energy, right? We should expect to put energy into this process. We should expect to lose energy because we're taking oxidized carbons and making reduced carbons. What else happens in this reaction? Um, is it not on the printout I gave you? Mm -hmm. Then yes, you should write it down. I'm sorry, I thought it was on the handout, but I did not put it on. I might have gotten the wrong year's handout too because I'm pretty sure I did that. In fact, when I looked for my slideshow this morning, I had to pull the slideshow up from like 2009 or something. I couldn't find my 2013 version. And so maybe I accidentally did that. So notice what else is going, well, I better pause for a minute while everyone writes it down. Um, you could take a cell phone picture too. Or I could email this out, I don't know. I'm surprised it's not on there. Because this is the handout I gave you, isn't it? Or did I not give you? I, okay, I'm sorry, I photocopied off the wrong one then, my bad. That's okay, the only step you're missing is step one, nothing else will change. No, I don't want to restart. And I should also re point out, I mean, I, I, I want you to write this whole thing down, but like, for instance, as a reminder, on the test, you're just given this, right? And you have to tell me about it. You don't have to memorize any steps in any chemical reactions whatsoever. That would be, I don't know, cruel and unusual punishment if you had to actually draw out the chemical steps for something like this. No, like I would never say, is this step zero? Um, what I would do is say, this is step zero, tell me about it. In fact, I told you I had, well, there, there are several homework questions that are literally, could be test questions. For instance, if you look at the back of 35A, you'll notice the two questions on, well, I broke it down into a few more than two questions, I guess, but I gave examples of what questions you would have. And if you look at chapter 34B, same thing, there's a question or two on there that are identical to the test. I also put that extra practice sheet up, which I haven't written the answer key for. That's maybe this afternoon's task. I'm also trying to finish up a new study guide, or at least revamping the old one. Putting in some more detail, taking out some stuff that we haven't covered. So what's happening here? This is a complicated reaction. I don't actually expect anyone necessarily to know all this, because uh, this is one of those unique ones that we don't see very much. So if we take a look at it, there's lots of things that are kind of going on in this reaction. Certainly, I would expect you guys to notice we lose ATP. Notice that we actually add CO2 to the molecule. And so notice that they've got the CO2 in red. And up here, there's that CO2. I should also point out that sometimes there's an H there. and sometimes not. That again is a book dependent process, meaning whether they show that as being a COOH or they just show that as a CO2. Notice that we also have a bunch of cofactors. You need magnesium, biotin, is, and, and all sorts of other things. And really what we should notice is that we went from something that has two carbons is something that has three carbons. That's the other important part. So remember, this is an anabolic process. We're trying to make a bigger molecule now. We kind of got used to in the last two processes making smaller molecules, chopping things up. We went from taking glucose with six carbons and we chopped glucose up into things that have three and two carbons, right? Now we're doing the exact same. And then with lipogenesis, we chopped off two carbons at a time. Here, 
we're actually adding and making a bigger molecule. So that's that preparation step. This is step one. What's happening here? It's not really obvious either. Again, I think the first couple reactions in this in these processes are more difficult to understand than the reactions that are happening in the other processes. This actually reminds me more of a first semester reaction, double displacement. Does that kind of help you see? Notice that here I've got ACPs and here I've got coenzyme A attached to it. Notice that we swap the coenzyme A's and the ACPs. And actually, I'm not even sure I can remember what ACP stands for. I think it stands for, oh, I remember, acetyl carrier protein, I think. Oh, never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, it's written right on the slide. What do you know, Jay? Protein carrier. So what I think of this as is this is, again, that flag or handle. So this usually indicates beta oxidation. If I've got an ACP attached to something, this indicates that we are going to do lipogenesis. And so one of the differences between uh, beta oxidation and lipogenesis is simply the protein that's attached to it or the handle that's on that molecule. And that's because even though technically uh, uh, the process of lipogenesis should kind of be the reverse of beta oxidation, it's not done with the same enzymes. Enzymes only tend to catalyze one reaction and they tend to catalyze it in one direction. So now that we're going the opposite direction, we need a whole new set of enzymes. If we need a whole new set of enzymes, they better recognize a new handle. And the reason for that is otherwise if we're doing beta oxidation with one set of enzymes, and the second set of enzymes uses the same handle, coenzyme A, then it would just be going back and forth between adding carbons and subtracting carbons from things, right? And we'd never have a net gain. Here, since we've got two different processes, if your body is breaking down fatty acids because it needs the energy, then, you know, that process is what's going on. If your body says, whoa, I got way excess amounts of energy, I'm going to start storing it away, then the second set of reactions, lipogenesis, happens and we start making the fatty acids from other sources of energy. For instance, you can eat um, no fat whatsoever in your diet and you can still get fat because your body makes fat. So if you just ate carbohydrates and protein in your diet and had cut out all fats, well, your body would still make them. Because lipogenesis is the process by which we make fats, right? So even if your body doesn't eat fat, it can get fat. I always kind of was tempted to try weird diets out when I first started teaching this class. I was like, man, I wonder if I just ate carbs, what would happen? Or if I just ate protein, what would happen? Or if I just ate fat, what would happen? And your body pretty much covers a lot of it, not all of it. Because you guys talked about other problems like, oh, I can't even pronounce it, Kawashuer and things like that. No. Yeah, and what was Mars or something or another? Yeah, that one. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the words. I don't want to lecture on it because I can't pronounce it. Uh, so anyway, step one is basically swapping handles or swapping recognition proteins. And it's also energy neutral, notice. There is no gain or loss. Okay, what about step two? Here's some interesting things start to happen. Okay, step two, what's happening here? 
This is again a new one, but can you kind of at least make a start at what's happening, what it looks like happens? So notice that I take two molecules, and this has got two carbons, this has got three carbons, and I make one molecule with four carbons. And then I've got a carbon stored away in my CO2. And remember, ACP, that's not a carbon, right? In fact, you know, even if you think that C is carbon, P is phosphorus, is there any element with A? No. This is called a condensation. It's basically the idea is we condense two molecules to one. Or if we go way back, we would have called that a combination reaction from you know, way back in chapter eight, first semester. So if you said condensation or if you said combination, I even give you credit for that. It is also called decarboxylation because it's basically minus CO2, if you'll notice, meaning we get a CO2 produced. That's a new name, it's a new reaction, don't worry about it too much. And really, I have to be honest, would I ever put this step on a test since it's got all this unique crap in it? No. So, you know, we'll talk about it. You should, you should be able to say something in it if you want, but really, I won't put this step on a test because it's a brand new reaction and it's not anything we've ever seen before. What? I should just wait for the little green bar to get almost done and say, ha, fooled you. Okay, that's me being silly. Okay, so now I've got my new four carbon molecule. So that's the one we want to keep an eye on. What's happening here? This is a step, for instance, we could ask a question about. I should also point that out in some of the other cycles. Tests, not, not every step in a cycle would ever show up on a test simply because some of them are terribly uninteresting. Yeah, so we, we broke this double bond. And so what type of reaction do we normally call that? Yeah, an addition. So we take that carbon double bond oxygen. Notice that we've got a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. And so what I'm really doing, maybe I'll draw it like this. I'm going like this across the double bond, right? What do we call that? It's an addition reaction. We could call it a hydrogenation. Or probably the easiest way to, or the best name for it, I'll put a star with it, is this is really a reduction. We gained two bonds, a hydrogen, we lost a bond to oxygen. And so really what we should say is if we look at this molecule, this is reduced. What does that mean for the coenzyme? It's oxidized, right? So this is an example of an oxidation reduction reaction. We would call it reduction normally simply because what we want to follow is the main molecule. But it's certainly an oxidation reduction reaction, although, like I said, we should probably call it a reduction. That's probably the best name. Also notice that we lose energy for the cell and we gain energy in the molecule. And so what we're really doing is we're storing energy in that molecule. We're taking usable energy, NADPH, and sticking it into a bond that's not so easy to get the energy out of. So that's step three. Who wants to take a stab at step four? Yeah, that's a, usually a good sign that it is a dehydration. And so where did we get the water from? Yeah, we've got an OH here. And then notice that we lose 
one of the hydrogens here, right? So there's our minus H2O. And so we took a secondary alcohol, minus H2O, and we made a alkene. And if we go way back, we should also recognize that we would use Saitseff's rule, meaning we take the carbon or the hydrogen from the carbon with the least number of hydrogens, meaning if you notice that one's got two, there's no reason that I couldn't take the hydrogen from the carbon with three, but Saitseff's rule says remove the, car remove the hydrogen from the carbon with the least number of hydrogens. That's going way back to either chapter 20, 20 or 22, I forget which one. And so, so, you know, something like that could be on the test. I can't remember if that's actually on the final or not. I remember that dehydration reactions are on the final, so you could have to apply Saitseff's rule technically. So, basically, this is a dehydration reaction. Notice that since there's no NADs, FADs, et cetera, it's energy neutral. Okay, step five. What happens here? Yeah, certainly focus in on the easy stuff. We lose energy. The coenzyme is oxidized, meaning it loses that bond to hydrogen. And where did the hydrogen end up going? So again, where do these hydrogens go? Yeah, so this is an addition reaction. If we're thinking chemistry, if we're thinking more biochemistry, we really should call this a reduction. I gained bonds. hydrogen. And so, of course, the molecule, oops, I guess I'll put it over here, the molecule, well, here's the molecule right here. So in this process, the molecule gains energy. Okay, from the response from the peanut gallery, which I guess is you guys, what I've noticed is that it seems like people are starting to get the, the, the different steps. And so, really, I think the best way to practice for this is to randomly pick one of the steps and put it up on the board or show it to each other. And gosh, I should put a quiz up on the internet sometime, but I don't. I've got that extra practice that's a bunch of questions. And the extra practice even involves questions from like the citric acid cycle and heck, I can't remember. I might have picked one from like the urea cycle or something too. But start to recognize what's happening from a chemist's point of view in these biochemical reactions. So overall, what we did is we took something that's two carbons plus three carbons, and we made something that's four carbons plus a CO2. And so notice that this is an anabolic process as we build a bigger molecule. And the idea is that now we can just repeat steps one through five over again, meaning that we can take this bigger molecule and react it with another mal malonyl ACP molecule, another three carbon chunk, and we can keep building up a bigger molecule. So kind of like lipogenesis and all the other processes, once they figure out a reaction to do for this, they tend to make it cyclic in nature so that you can keep reusing the parts. Instead of having a different reaction add the next two carbons and another reaction after that add another two carbons, that just makes it too complex of a process overall. So your body likes to add cycles like that. So the end product, oops, how did that get there? Oh, I see, that's right. Now we're on to blank slides again. So the end product of lipogenesis is typically, not always, typically palmitic acid, which again is a 16 carbon acid. Um, you'll never have to remember what palmitic acid is if it shows up on a test or steric acid or any other acid. 
it's technically on your cheat sheet from the fatty acid chapter and you would have that on any test that you want. So if we take a look at it, we could write the overall reaction as being an acetyl coenzyme A plus seven malonyl coenzyme A's. And so notice that this is my two carbon chunk, that's the three carbon chunks. Plus, if you count up it, we would need 14 NADPHs, and we'd also need 14 hydrogens to make a balanced reaction. So notice that we use two NADPHs per cycle, and we're really doing seven <coughs> cycles when we do this. So if I take all of those parts and I keep redo redoing that cycle over and over again, I get palmitic acid which again is 16 carbons, whoops, plus seven CO2s, because remember if that's three carbons, that's the seven CO2s that are popped off it, plus six waters, plus eight co-ashes, plus 14 NADP pluses. So notice that this is the storage form, meaning it's high energy. This is low energy, meaning we've used energy in this process. We've used 14 NADPs. How many ATPs did we use? 14 times 3, which in the book, well, 3 times 4 is 2, carry my 1, 42 ATP. So it takes 40 AT, 42 ATP, and you can store that in palmitic acid. Yeah, restart later. So we've talked about two cycles today. We wait for a moment. Yeah, if we, if we talked about ATP equivalents, we didn't really use any ATP in this reaction. Well, okay, we used one in that first step. Step zero, which they don't count in the book. So we talked about two processes, beta oxidation and lipogenesis. And this one was catabolic. This one is anabolic. This one uses coash as our coenzyme. This one uses ACP as our coenzyme. So they really use different enzymes. And notice I'm leaving that vague. Did you notice that there was no enzymes listed in any of these reactions? Meaning, for instance, when we went through the one, one uh, reaction, or one reaction, okay, Jay, be a little less specific than that. When we went through the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway, we had all of the enzymes listed in it. Because the slides I had had all those enzymes in it, and it's a somewhat interesting. And certainly for those isomerization steps, it was nice to know isomerase, right? And so sometimes the enzymes gave us clues. Here, you know, your book doesn't go into it. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, I didn't find a good set of slides that showed all of that, but they definitely use different enzymes in this reaction because one set of enzymes reacts with CoH, CoAcetyl, CoAsh, and the other one works with ACP. Another difference is that this actually takes place in the mitochondria or near it. This actually can occur in the cytoplasm. And then a last one is this uses malonyl. This does not, so there's nothing there. So for instance, one of the things I found in the past is students would quite often mix up whether we were in beta oxidation or lipogenesis. So if I show you a reaction from this, what's the easiest way to tell which one we're in? Probably that. If you see a bunch of co-ashes around, you know you're in beta oxidation, if you see a bunch of ACPs, you know you're doing lipogenesis. 
And that's it. I think that, well, let me double check. Is there anything else I want to say? I'll look at the homework assignment, make sure I either answered the questions or the questions are readable in the book. I think we actually did a pretty good job. Oh, I didn't answer question number 11, but um, that one you guys can figure out yourself. So that's it. What we're looking at then for the rest of the semester is you've got a test tomorrow on chapter 32, oh, 31 and 32. Monday we'll review, last chance to ask questions, etc. Tuesday we have a test on 33 through 35. I will post a study guide and I'll probably print it off and bring it to the test tomorrow if I remember right. Uh, showing just, I'm uh, taking out all the stuff that we didn't study and won't show up on this test and doing that. So Wednesday, why did I say I'm going to post a study guide? I'll post this, I'll do a study guide here. Wednesday we'll study organic chemistry. And Thursday we'll study uh, biochemistry, meaning that these are reviews. Friday there is no class and then finals week on Monday our final is what 745 to 9 o'clock I think don't quote me on the time because I'm not looking and then on Tuesday I think our final is just at 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock something like that these are these are guesstimates and that I'm pretty sure the way our final schedule works, we do that. I should also point out, and maybe we should do this, uh, ask me next week. We'll probably do the, that in a different room than we normally do, but we'll see. Any questions? Um, homework, uh, really homework 33. 4A, B, we were, could have been due Wednesday. We didn't mention it, so turn it in when you want. Um, certainly, 35A, if you want to get it graded, needs to be turned in Monday, so we can just sit and grade it real quick or sometime earlier than that. Or, you know, you can pick it up Monday afternoon. You guys have Todd's A&P class finishing, not Todd's A&P class, micro finishing up your unknowns. I was going to say, actually, sometimes people finish them early. How many of you finished them? 